Are you struggling to find something to do now that we're going through the writers and actors' strikes? Too Opinionated has you covered 625 and counting episodes of the best actors, musicians, writers, and everybody involved in the entertainment universe. Go to MeisterCon Pod on YouTube and subscribe, and you'll never miss an episode. Thank you guys for your support. Until next time, bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. I am really excited today. I've got the president of both the Hollywood Museum and the Jose Iturbi Foundation, Donnell Dadigan, with me. So welcome, Donnell. Hey, Michael, so good to be with you today. You were telling me before we started the interview that you're you're doing the interview in front of the Pointer Sisters exhibition, which is pretty great. Oh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, the Pointer Sister Anita, mm -hmm. you know, not June, not Bonnie, not Ruth, but Anita, uh, she has collected these costumes for, uh, actually, she tells me 50 years. And what's so wonderful about these costumes is it's not just her own costumes, but the costumes of all four sisters. And so it's fun because you can, we recreate with monitors and video uh, the scenes from their performances on stage wearing these costumes. And now you get to see the costumes up close and personal. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And, and I was uh, talking with you a little bit about the fact that there's just the one sister left now, which is, is, is it's difficult, especially for someone that grew up with their music to to kind of live through the passing of of most of the sisters. Does does the remaining sister, does she perform at all? Yes, she does. She performs yeah. with her daughter and her granddaughters. And they are booked and billed as the Pointer Sisters. And they sing all the great songs, you know. You you Love can't that. help but as they say from the era groove to it. <laughs> well they're such great uh, music and and their songs they were they were very um they got you dancing you know very catchy tunes that was their goal yeah bring happiness to everyone well they did a great job it was very uh they were you know very like their songs kind of brought people together good party songs yes yeah yeah it was really uh really good so so donnell let's start uh this way you know, tell us a little bit about your life, your background, you know, how you got uh, kind of into the entertainment business. You know, give us a little bit of background. Oh, my goodness. Well, I don't consider myself part of the entertainment business, <laughs> uh, but somehow I'm involved in it day in and day out. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I I taught school for five years. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, was in the real estate business. I would sell real estate. And maybe that's where the hook is because I had a lot of clients who were celebrities uh, in front of the camera, as well as the executives behind the camera, both in television and film. And um, got into real estate development, uh, which I still do today. And uh, wanted to uh, give something back to the community for the wonderful, wonderful uh, career that I had in real estate with all these entertainers. And I thought, you know, uh, well, and I have to say with my mother and I, we just, my mom was a, by the way, my mother was a school teacher. I think there's a joke there somewhere. My dad <laughs> taught school for a little bit too. My, my dad but, was a school teacher. So all of us being school teachers, we thought about what could be the most interesting, you know, uh, thing to do if we want to give something back to the community. And for us, it's always uh, educational, knowledge-based. And I learned as a teacher that for me to teach my kids, uh, I had to entertain them because when I entertained them and they enjoyed sitting in the classroom and enjoyed listening to me, all of a sudden their ears opened up, their minds were like uh, sponges, just receiving all the information. And they did so much better. And then I know Mike, you're going to say, well, what subjects did you teach? <laughs> well, that's the fun part of it all. I taught a very important class. Well, in the grand scheme of things, maybe not so much to all your listeners, but uh, I taught music appreciation. Oh, yeah. So, I think that's a very important class. Well, they don't do it anymore. And uh, it was one of the things that first things to go in the state of California uh, when they were cutting back. But I have to say that um, 
my kids uh, today, I still see them. They're all grown, of course, several of them in the entertainment industry and well-known names, uh, but um, they all enjoyed their class and they love to come tell me even to this day. Uh, I remember what you said about Johann Sebastian Bach. I remember what you said about Frederick Chopin. I remember what you said about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So I did my duty and I think it probably was good because these young people still remembered some of the subject matters and some of the topics, but that's what led me to want to do something again, educational and entertaining, and that would be a museum. So as much as we entertain everyone with all like the costumes that you see behind me from the Pointer Sisters, we also educate them as to how long they performed, where they performed, who the costume designers were, what were the thoughts behind the songs, which awards did they win, some personal anecdotes also, which are always fun. Yeah, I love that. And and I would say that's a, a, a very important part of the entertainment uh, business because you're preserving the history. So I, I would count you as an entertainer. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your godfather, Jose Aturbi. You know, you've got, uh, and you've been spending a lot of time on it, but but you're releasing a book that has like 16 CDs with it of his music. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's a fabulous coffee table book with 16 CDs of digitally remastered, never before heard recordings of my godfather, Jose Aturbi, and they are from the vaults of RCA. Can you imagine the RCA vaults? And my godfather probably... Uh, recorded more than 50 albums during his time. But uh, these recordings were never released. And so uh, I'm thrilled because it's Sony Classical Records uh, who uh, put this together with Michael Feinstein. Yes, the famous Michael Feinstein, the singer and pianist. And, you know, he's also a conductor uh, oh. of the Pasadena Pops and several other orchestras nationwide. And I think it's fun for us because we see the similarities between Jose Aturbi and Michael Feinstein. So that allowed for me to be open to this project. And Michael has penned a wonderful essay on the life of my godfather and the Jose Aturbi Foundation. Uh, in our archives, we pulled together all of the photographs and several of uh, the recordings and whatnot because we had some of them, even though they were annotated uh, from RCA vaults, uh, they, uh, my godfather landed up with several of the copies. And would you believe they're on glass records in 78? Really? Yes. So interesting. You know, there's a whole world out there that, you know, we, we think, okay, there's a 78, there's a 45, there's a 33, right. a long play record. Uh, but then when they came, uh, what was it? Uh, eight track, then, you know, <laughs> set and now yep. CDs and, uh, you know, who knows what next will be, well, we do know, but it, it's so interesting when you think about, uh, how all these different generations of storing music, uh, how they were done and the new inventions and how they replace the old ways of doing it. Yeah, it is really interesting. And, and if you, you know, the last 20 or 30 years, we've changed over several times. You know, I remember uh, when 8-Tracks came out, that was a big deal, you know, yes, and when they were replaced with cassettes and then even bigger when, when uh, CDs came out. I've even got a uh, an old Victrola wow. uh, record player that's just, it's, and we probably got a couple hundred of the records, so it's the little ones that are kind of hard, you know, most of those are RCA records but and you got to crank the victrola to to get them to play and then my uh my best friend his family passed down one of the um the the record players that were on discs so they were like the cylinders that you would yes to play so there you know there's even more going back but i've never heard of a glass record well yes that was before they put it on vinyl and most of them would break. So it's very rare that we have a few of those. That's amazing. Yeah. What was it like, you know, growing up with him as a, uh, a godparent? I mean, did you, 
were you musically inclined when you were younger? Did did you learn to play a, a piano or another instrument? Well, my mother was a great violinist. Okay. And my mother wanted for me to study piano. And uh, so my first piano teacher was Jose Iturbi's sister, Amparo Iturbi, who was equally as extraordinary as a concert pianist, I believe. You know, I I adored uh, Jose Turby's sister. And as a child, because she was a concert pianist and she was my teacher, I always called her Miss Turby. <laughs> Miss well, Turby. And, and is it is it some of her work that's also in the book? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that question, Michael. Yes, there are some duo piano uh, recordings also. Uh, one or two singular recordings of Amparo Iturbi, as well as with the orchestra and some from film because my godfather loved all the different elements uh, that Hollywood had. And from mm, the 30s on, he lived in Beverly Hills, California. Yeah. Well, and I know that he, you know, had uh, relationships with uh, Sinatra and some of the you know, the big stars of the, uh, the day with that. And he, he would show up, uh, in different movies, if I remember right, kind of playing, uh, uh, his stuff or doing the music for movies. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Michael. So. You know, um, my godfather, uh, was a very interesting man. He really was, uh, uh very scholarly, uh, yeah. for being a musician because once upon a time, musicians were musicians and that's what they did and nothing more and nothing less. And I guess it's like, you know, once upon a time, doctors were doctors, nothing more, nothing less. That's what they did. But now uh, my godfather was one of the first that crossed over uh, from solely playing music to now looking to different forms of entertainment. Right. And he realized that to keep classical music alive, uh, he had to somehow find a way to reach out to the younger generations, yeah. uh, to the kids, to the teenagers, to the people that were in their early 20s, because many of the young people in, you know, the 40s and the 50s, well, they didn't want to hear this classical long haired music. <laughs> you know, they wanted some fun stuff going on. They needed to have big bands. They needed to have the beginnings of rock and roll. And so. Uh, where my godfather lived, it was so interesting. He had a head of a studio, Harry Cohn, that was his neighbor. Down the street was the director, Jean Negolesco. Mm -hmm. Behind him uh, were several uh, actors, including Lucille Ball, Jack Benny, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, across the street, there were more. It was quite something. And they yeah, would quite all the get neighborhood. together. Yeah, they would all get together, you know, and uh, uh, maybe have a dinner uh, on the weekend, on a Sunday, uh, or they would have the men would get together for drinks, whatnot, cocktails and talk about the world, whatnot. But it was brought to him that the studios were thinking about trying to make motion pictures more culture conscious and bringing a higher quality of entertainment. And they thought that if they could bring some classical musicians, concert artists yeah. uh, to their uh, films, that that would be great. And my godfather uh, at that time was one of the most famous pianists in the world and conductors in the world. He routinely performed to sold out auditoriums, so much so that he always felt bad about having to turn listeners, viewers, audience away. And so he would tell the theaters in the box office sell a couple hundred extra tickets if you want we'll put the we'll put chairs up on the stage if i'm performing solo in a recital there'll be room uh, we can seat the overflow on stage and he did that on a routine regular basis so he had this name of being very popular for classical music so he was perfect to be uh, the one to help popularized classical music to the younger generations through film. Uh, but he had some requirements, Michael, like all great artists, you know, of course, <laughs> you know, they have their set of requirements and no, it wasn't green jelly beans in his dressing room <laughs> or licorice. Uh, but what it was that he had to always play himself. He always had to be a good guy. 
And he always had to play piano and conduct an orchestra. Yeah, I kind of love that. You know, it's and as a specific. result, oh yes. And as a result, uh, he did what the studios wanted by bringing classical music and the popularity of it uh, to help that into the films and to bring a little bit more culture. But what that also did was expand the audience in general to come to a classical concert, music concert. Yeah, I, I love that. Did it, did his music, did it did it change at all through the decades? Because like the 40s, it, it was all big band. And then it kind of transitioned to rock and roll and that stuff. Or did he just stick with the classical and kind of use that as his uh, platform? you know, to, to get music out to people or did the changing, you know, musical landscape, did that affect him to where his music changed through the years? Well, that's a great question. And it's a little complicated because my godfather was known as a concert pianist and conductor, as we talked about, and it was always with classical music and the great classical composers. Uh, that was from day one until his passing in 1980. But what he did do, because he made friends with all these movie stars and popular singers along the way, mm -hmm. especially during the 40s and 50s, uh, that uh, he enjoyed accompanying them. So he would all of a sudden accompany, uh, well, actually, he, I have to say, first of all, he played a mean boogie woogie, if you can imagine <laughs> such a thing, really good for that era, really quite something. But uh, he loved to accompany Judy Garland. Yeah. He accompanied Frank Sinatra. Uh, you know, it was something for them to come out. Uh, they would be performing at the Hollywood Bowl or, or or at one of these great theaters, even at Carnegie Hall. And he would just pop out on stage. Of course, they had it arranged, but he was su a surprise guest sometimes. And sometimes uh, it was noted that he would be performing with them and he would accompany them and the house would just go wild and crazy demanding encore after encore after encore. It's difficult, I think, to to fully let people know just how popular he was, you know, back at that time. Because he was very well. Now, he was the, if I remember right, he's, he's the first person that sold a million records, which you would have thought would have been maybe an Elvis, a Beatles, something like that. But it wasn't. It was him. Well, you're absolutely correct. And he was the first musician to sell a million copies of one record. And it was, interestingly enough, Chopin, Frederick Chopin's Military Polonaise. And, you know, my godfather, because of these movies and everything that he was in, uh, he was already very popular and very famous. And as we talked about, you know, sold out crowds everywhere he went. But now he had groupies. Now, you know, <laughs> these were women that would rush the stage uh, at the end of a performance. And, you know, he would play encore after encore. And, you know, Lord only knows what groupies do today, what they throw up on stage. But during my godfather's time, it was scented handkerchiefs and flowers. Oh. That's That seems very, uh, very nice. That well, you know, he, was, he, he was a rock star before his time. He flew his own plane. He even rode a motorcycle. I mean, he was quite something. He boxed. You know, he loved to box uh, to keep himself in shape. And I mean, you uh, don't expect that from a pianist, you know, and none of it. And it's, I think it's amazing that he just had his own plane and not just as, as a hobby, really. He actually flew it pretty frequently. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes he would put his orchestra in. He had a small plane to begin with, and the plane grew larger and larger as <laughs> his career and who and what a Jose Aturbi was grew. So did his airplane. And sometimes he would cart his orchestra from concert to concert, and they would all go together. And uh, uh, it was all about camaraderie for my godfather. He really enjoyed making music and making friends along the way. Yeah, I, I love that about him. My my mother is just a huge fan of his. She, of course. She's a she's a piano player as as well. And yeah, this is the the book is definitely one that I'm gonna get for her because she she will love it. You know, I can I know I can she see will. her playing the CDs and then and then trying to uh you know uh, match it on the piano, that type of thing, because that's kind of what she does. I, I'm excited to get that for her. Well, you know, I have to just share with you that uh, several of my friends who are in the entertainment industry, uh, 
they really enjoy it every night. They have a drink uh, for cocktails before dinner and they play one of the CDs and they listen to it. It takes them back to a different time. And one of the comments that I got with a buddy of mine, who's a producer, he said, Danielle, he said, that sound is fabulous. It's like Hosea Turby is sitting in your living room, right with you sitting at your piano and playing. And I said, well, we did a good job. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. And it amazes me because I've listened to some of those old recordings and they're difficult sometimes to to listen to. So, so I'm sure the amount of work you had to put in to really restore them to where where today it sounds just like when he actually did the music. That's pretty amazing. Well, it truly is. And we have to, you know, we have to thank Sony uh, Classical Recording because uh, they did a masterful job on restoring it. They digitally yeah. remastered it. They took out every crack. They took out every pop. They took out every hiss. They took out the dullness, uh, yeah. ultimately what happened. And my godfather was so into always wanting to record where it sounded like he wasn't in a recording studio, but he was sitting with you in your home. And we accomplished that. Yeah, I love that. Did you ever have him over when you were little for like a a holiday dinner or something like that? Or maybe him and his sister both where they would play music at the dinner? Well, you know, that's that's a very good question. Uh, My godfather uh, always loved to come over. Mm -hmm. And uh, but instead, it was me who would play. (laughs) <laughs> and my godfather and his sister, my first piano teacher on Parui Turby, uh, the two of them would look at each other knowingly and decide how they were going to critique me. And at uh, some point, uh, always, uh, my godfather would push me off the piano bench and he'd sit down and play it the correct way, as he thought. And then I would sit back down and play it that way. And then mm, his sister, she would tell me, very good. Or sometimes she would even say, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have to work on that at our next piano lesson. <laughs> well, so were you like before those dinners and you, you had to know what was coming, Did were you nervous or excited? Um, That's a great question, Michael. And I got to say, I don't think I was nervous and I don't think I was excited. It was just matter of fact. It was just part of the evening, you know, and and, and that kind of goes with the fact that I may not have realized what a Jose Turby really was. Right. You know, I was just a child. Uh, you know, I knew that he knew a lot of people, but uh, but he always had time for me. And he was such a great godparent. I have to say, yeah. you know, most of us, when, you know, we have godparents, well, they send a birthday card with a check in it or a $5 bill and something for the holidays with something very nice written in the card and a check or, you know, a a $5 bill. Uh, But my godfather just lived up the street from me and his sister lived across the street from me. And so uh, I saw them all the time. And when my godfather's career slowed down, uh, I saw him several afternoons and evenings a week. That's amazing. I, I really love that. Was there a time in your life where it fully hit you just how famous he was? You know, I got to think about that. Um, I suppose I did uh, when I was in my 20s. And uh, I, I caught that, but he still was padrino, which means godfather in Spanish. You know, he still was. I used to walk him out on stage, you know, I'm I'm just chattering with you now, but uh, after he had a cataract surgery, uh, the bright lights, the glare from those stage lights when he would walk out sometimes would catch him and he would just need a little bit of comfort to know that there was someone right next to him. And we would walk out arm in arm and uh, uh, just to get him to the piano between, because a lot of times, as we talked about before, there could be 100, 150, 200 people sitting on stage. So- (laughs) All of a sudden, this walk on stage was, wasn't that wide open space like you would right. normally have. And so there was maybe only five or six feet between uh, the chair and uh, the last chair uh, and the edge of the stage that was free and open for him to walk. And with those bright lights and glare, he didn't want to take a chance. 
And so I would just walk with him to the piano. Once he got to the piano, he was perfectly, you know, able to navigate everything and everyone. But um, yes, for me, that was a very big deal to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And at those moments, you know, in these sold out uh, concert halls, you know, of three, four, five, seven, eight thousand people, 10,000 people to see everyone just standing and applauding him before he even played one note, you know, was just <laughs> extraordinary. Again, like I said, because he was Padrino. Yeah. You know, I, I, he was also Jose Aturbi, the concert great, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I I just I think that's that's so fascinating. I love those type of uh, stories where you know as a, as a kid you don't you don't really think about how famous somebody is. You just enjoy the time with them. Yes. But at some point you're going to get to the age and you're going to be like, "Oh, okay. <laughs> maybe maybe they're a little bit more than what I thought." <laughs> They have another side to them. There's another, another story to tell. <laughs> so does the uh, does the book does it give you um, stories about him? Yes, yes, it does. Michael Feinstein did a fabulous job. We spoke about different stories and different elements in his life, and yeah. Michael Feinstein is a fabulous wordsmith, and he's put together some great stories uh, that are accompanied by some wonderful photographs. I mean, we have photographs of, of, of Jose when he was a baby with his family taken, you know, uh, at the turn of the 1900s and the early 1910 era. Uh, it's just phenomenal, just phenomenal, you know? Yeah, what a book. Well, and we're thrilled because at the same time, we've got these fabulous photographs of the Turby with these Hollywood movie stars and all the posters from the different MGM musicals. And then, you know, conducting in sold out concert halls and oh, um, even the USO shows and the US war bond uh, uh, tours that they did right. for World War II. Uh, and sitting next to Jose in one of the photographs is Lucille Ball. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing. And he probably just looked at those people as peers. Well, they were all neighbors and they were all out to have a good time when they were together because, believe it or not, they all worked very hard in their craft and for their career. Well, you'd have to. To to reach that level, you'd have to to practice a ton. Yeah, that's 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 really amazing. When does the uh when does the book come out? Well, the book just came out and we're thrilled about it. And you can get it, of course, on Amazon. It's in Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. and it's on many uh, online uh, book dealers, sellers. And it's quite something. Uh, I have to say a 180 page uh, book with photographs galore, discography, filmography, the story of Jose and his family. Uh, and uh, again, the photographs just lend such credence to the story and give such color and vibrancy it's a I saw some book. of the photographs they're amazing i mean they're they're really well done thank you thank you and then the 16 cds you know it's it's quite extraordinary and to think that you know they were found in the vaults of rca yeah it's amazing there was that much material i mean 16 cds is a lot of music yes it is <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's I I think the whole project is just amazing. I think it's it's. Let me make sure I got the title right. From Hollywood to the world. Yes, from Hollywood to the world, the rediscovered recordings of pianist and conductor Jose Aturbi. Wow, wow! I I, I it, it amazes me that you were even able to put that together. Was there a time that that you kind of, you discovered they had all this music. Did you know right away that, that you were wanting to put something together or did it just over time, you're like, Hey, we should probably do something with all that. Well, you know, Michael, it's interesting. You say that my godmother, when she was still living, uh, we put together one CD of recordings of Jose 
and one CD of recordings with his sister Amparo. Yeah. And we had such fun picking the cover. It was a CD. And, you know, you remember the pl uh, clear plastic jewel cases where oh, the yeah. CD would go in. And then there was the photograph uh, for the cover of it. And then inside there was a few paragraphs about the artist. And then they listed all the pieces that were being played on that CD. Well, we were so excited that we did this. Uh, and then... Uh, a couple of years ago, I get a phone call. I don't pay any attention about it. And then I get another phone call. And this person says, hi, it's Michael Feinstein. <laughs> and you, you don't know me, but I know all about you. And we have this friend, this friend, and this friend in common. And I listened. And I had always wanted to do something like this. I felt this would just be, you know, again, another love letter back to the world to show off my godfather's talents and all the music that gave them smiles and made them feel good. And they could evoke a time in their lives that maybe had been forgotten, but the music would bring it back for them. And so I loved what Michael had to say. And I loved his passion. And we got started working on this together. Yeah, I, I, that's amazing. What a phone call that would be to get. It really was. And he said to me, you're never going to believe it. He said, but Sony has gotten a hold of the RCA vaults. Gosh, only knows how that happens, but it did. And uh, we were thinking it would be great if we would re-release these recordings. And I said, well, they have to be digitally remastered. They have to be in pristine condition as though they would be recorded today. And uh, Michael listened and um, he's a very thoughtful individual and so successful on his own. Oh my goodness. You know, he has accompanied so many greats, Liza Minnelli. I mean, he worked for the Gershwins. I can go down the list. It's extraordinary. And so uh, we had a lot of fun with this, I have to say, but it really was a project thanks to Sony, Sony Classical Recordings. A big thank you to Michael Feinstein for really, you know, keeping us on track and, uh, you know, the foundation, we have enjoyed every moment working with this and providing much needed assets to this. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it was just a blast putting this together. Not easy, but I'm sure you had a, a terrific time. Did I see that you had uh, put it, nominated it for some of the Grammys? Well, we're in the process of being nominated now. Okay. And we'll see uh, what uh, the first round of voting brings. And I look forward to it. I think it'll be so much fun. And um, uh, it's quite spectacular. Everyone who has seen the book and listened to the recordings is, at the very least, overwhelmed. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I can't I can't wait to uh, to get our copy in. Um, and listen to them with my mother. She's such a fan of uh, of piano. I'm excited to to see because I know that's gonna it's going to take up a ton of her time getting through yeah. all that because she'll listen to all of it. And that's what we want, you know. It, it's so much fun because some of these pieces you remember where you were when you first heard the piece, and that means so much. And in fact, let's make sure that we do get you one of these books with the 16 CDs, your mother will adore it and you will enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, I, I will. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've always enjoyed listening to, um, to her play. You know, I was never, uh, musically inclined, but I, I've always enjoyed it. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited for it. It's going to be, uh, uh, fun, uh, seeing her with, uh, with that. Well, uh, Danelle, thank you so much. This has been terrific. I I'm so excited to get a chance to to speak with you. And I'm sure that if we wanted to, we could talk all day about all the different <laughs> things that you have been involved in. <laughs> You'll have to come back at some point so we can just talk about all the things that you do. Sounds great, Michael. It'll be so much fun. And I'll see you in Hollywood. You will. Next time, I told you, next time I'm in, I will make a point to, uh, to stop by. I'd, I'd absolutely love that. Well, so, so last thing before we uh, before we wrap up, um, if someone wants to find out more about you or the uh, Hollywood Museum or the foundation, you know, are you on social media? And if so, where can we find you? 
Yes. So we are on social media uh, at hashtag Hollywood Museum mm -hmm. and um, hashtag Hosea Turby. And uh, we have HoseaTurbyFoundation.com is our website. And for the museum, it's TheHollywoodMuseum.com. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty great. And I love that that you did the museum because you know, I'm a fan. I'm a Hollywood fan, just like a lot of people are. And when we come to to LA for for a vacation or business or whatever, I mean, it's fun going down to Hollywood and and experiencing some of the history and looking at the stars and and going to the museums. Uh I I can't wait to get in there and see. I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't done it yet. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, if you have just a moment, you know, when I got together with my mother, we thought about what shall we do? And I thought, well, we need to do this museum in Hollywood. And where should that be? And we went up and down Hollywood Boulevard and so many storefronts were vacant and empty, but there was this one building that I, <laughs> I kept going to and it was right around the corner from Hollywood Boulevard on Highland. And it's yeah. the old Max Factor makeup studio. It's Max Factor Cosmetics. Max Factor was the makeup king to Hollywood uh, for yeah. many decades. And I kept thinking, this is fabulous. And in it, they had these world famous makeup rooms, you know, the Blonde's only room where Marilyn Monroe became a blonde, the yeah. uh, redhead's only room where Lucille Ball received her signature hair. And uh, so interesting. And I thought, wow, if these walls could talk. <laughs> but there was a problem. The building was not for sale. So I had to use my real estate background to figure out how to be able to talk the owners into selling this building. And the owners were Procter and Gamble, who at the time owned Max Factor Cosmetics. So we've had a lot of fun because we tell the story of Hollywood from its humble beginnings all the way until today. And, you know, everyone should come. You can have a chance to see what it is that you like, what it is that you haven't learned about before, haven't seen before. And as we say, there's something for everyone in the Hollywood Museum. Yeah, terrific. Well, well, Donnell, thank you so much. This has been terrific. You've been terrific. I'm so happy that we got a chance to talk. Thank you. Me too. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, this has been terrific. I can't wait to get the get the copy of the book. It's out now, so so everybody should go out and get that, especially if they're a music fan. I think they'll uh, enjoy. And what a book! I mean, people are always setting books out on their coffee table. I mean, this would be terrific for that. You put that out, I guarantee it's going to start some conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Donnell. Hold on one second. How terrific was that, uh, Donnell Dadigan, the president of the Hollywood uh, Museum and the Jose Aturbe's uh, Foundation? Just a uh, fascinating uh, woman to to talk to because she's been involved uh, with not just Hollywood, but with the uh, real estate scene there in uh, Los Angeles and around Hollywood. Um uh, the stories that she could tell, I, I think would fill up an entire podcast. I think she does a little bit of uh, uh, podcasting. Uh, if it be, And if she doesn't, she should, because I know that it would be such an interesting podcast to listen to, uh, to all of those uh, Hollywood stories. If you're in Hollywood, especially if you're visiting for the first time and you're checking out the sign and, uh, the the you know the the Walk of Fame, all of that. Make sure you stop by the Hollywood Museum. Tell tell them that uh, that Mike sent you from the Two Opinionated Podcast, uh, and and please let me know if you go. I'd love to uh, love to hear about that. I hope you enjoyed that, especially if you're a music lover, or if you're a, a, a piano lover, or if you love the classics. I think this is the book. For you, and not too many books come with 16 CDs, 16. Uh, that's just amazing. It's just amazing. If you're finding us for the first time and you enjoyed it, thank you. And we'd love to have your support. It's easy to do. It's free. You know, if you prefer to watch our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. We just ask that you subscribe. Would really appreciate that. If you prefer to listen, just wherever you listen to your podcast at, subscribe there 
that'll help us out. We put out episode 656 today. We normally put out about four episodes a week. Um, you can find all of those audio and video on our website, meistercon.com. So definitely check us out there. Um, I would also ask that you go to imdb.com. That's the entertainment database, imdb.com. And just look up the Two Opinionated Podcast. Just that traffic on our page. I, I know it sounds silly, but it really does help us a ton. And it helps us to attract uh, the terrific guests that, that we've been so lucky to have on the show. So imdb.com, just look up the Two Opinionated Two Opinionated Podcast. It's free, doesn't cost you anything, helps us so much. IMDb just recently named us one of its top 100 podcasts of something that we're really proud of. There's like 15 million podcasts to be in the top 100 is uh, really special, especially for just a father and son team working in a small town in West Virginia. Never would have thought five years ago when we started that we would be here now, but here we are. We're so thankful to our fans, to our listeners. Thank you so much. And if you're new to us, we really do appreciate the time that you spent. Thank you so much. Until next time. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm once again here to ask for your support. It's been a big year for the Two Opinionated Podcast. Back in February, we got to live out a dream, moderate for William Shatner here in our hometown. In May, we passed 100,000 downloads on our YouTube channel. And we followed that up in June with 50,000 downloads on the audio side. We recently posted our 600th episode, which is pretty good volume for just a uh, father and son operation. You know, not too many podcasts can keep that volume up. We've been doing this now for four and a half years, 600 plus episodes. We recently hit 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is a really big deal for us because we've always gotten the views but have struggled to get people to subscribe. So that 1,000 was a big deal for us. And best of all, we were recently named one of the top podcasts on IMDb, which is the entertainment database. You know, those that are ahead of us, we came in at number 82. Those that are ahead of us are bigger companies like Disney, mostly Marvel, and Joe Rogan, that type of uh, podcast. So for us, being just a, a small West Virginia father and son podcast, to be in the top 100 out of 15 million, it's a pretty big deal for us. So thank you for everything you've done for us so far. Got a couple little ways, though, that you can help us, and they're free, and they're really easy. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, Please go to YouTube. It's under MeisterCon Pod. Just hit subscribe. It's free. Doesn't cost you anything. Really helps us a ton. And maybe even more important, if you could go to IMDB, IMDB.com, look up the Two Opinionated Podcast and just look around the page. Just having that traffic on the page really helps us out. So that's a couple easy ways that you can support us, even. If you're not listening or watching all of the time, and we want you to listen and watch, because I think that our our guest list I would put up against anybody, any other show, podcast, anybody out there. I think our guest list holds up. So please check us out. You you probably will find somebody that you like, or maybe somebody that you didn't know you liked, but kind of discovered them on there. There's tons of that. If you're into music, we have that too. If you like books, we've got authors on there. If you if you're more into what goes on behind the scenes in the entertainment world, you know, we've got producers, directors, um, video artists, anything you can think of that happens behind the scenes, we've had them on the show. So definitely check us out. Thank you guys so so much. Until next time. Bye everybody.